Hi everyone, welcome to Crowdfunding 101. This is Prashant Paramnathan from Chuff.org. We're really excited to have you. Let's get into it. So a lot of uh, nonprofits often come to us with this question. You might have this question in your head. Um, and it's a question of how do I get more donors to fund my project? Uh, and you know, sometimes the answer to that is go and find some high net worth donors or go and find some philanthropic donors and write grant applications. Uh, and then people think, okay, maybe I could do a crowdfunding campaign to find more donors. Now, I think this is the wrong question. And I think it's the wrong question because it puts the nonprofit or the social cause uh, in the position of being uh, subordinate to the person funding the project. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what the right question that I think we should be asking is uh, for all of our projects. Um, and I'll tell you why this is important in a second, but it, it'll sound a little bit controversial when I first say it, but this is the question. What if supporting your project was as fun as buying shoes? That's what we're going to try and do today. That's what I'm going to try and nut into is like how do we make your projects as fun and supporting your projects as fun as buying a pair of shoes? Because if it's as fun as buying a pair of shoes, you'll be able to attract people to your project. You, won't, you are no longer in the position of subordinate. You have something great to offer them and they're going to enjoy being a part of it. Now, if that sounds slightly impossible or a pipe dream, um, this is an example from a real campaign and this is a comment from one of the donors. I'm going to actually read this out verbatim. Thank you, Edgar's Mission, for letting me be a small part of this project. I'm looking forward to visiting you on New Digs. Love your work. That's a donor thanking an organization for letting them donate to their campaign. Okay, so how do we do this? There's five steps to creating a great campaign, and this is going to be a lot of content. Um, I'm going to dump it through, but ask questions as we go along. We'll pick them up at the end. So the first step is choosing the right project. The right project for crowdfunding is not necessarily the same as the right project for writing a grant application. And there are three things that we look for in a great crowdfunding project. We've run thousands of these, and the ones that succeed all have these three elements in them. The first is they're specific, not general. Um, and these are examples of real campaigns that I'll use through here. Uh, and so excuse me for reading them out, but uh, it gives you a sense of um, what the differences are. So the first one says, did you scream no when you heard the Sawtell Cinema had closed? Well, sing hallelujah because Sawtell Cinema is on the way back. See you at the movies in December. Now, if I ask you what is that campaign about, you'll be able to tell me straight away. On the other hand, here's another campaign. We are raising funds to support vulnerable children, young people, and families in the community. Now, that could be one of hundreds of organizations. Um, and if you use a general uh, mode, actually there's nothing unique or special about your campaign and people love funding things that are unique and special. And they also love funding things that have a specific outcome. So th the test for this one is at the end of our campaign, Will there be a specific outcome that's delivered? And people hear this and go, oh, no, I want to fund my um, admin costs. I want to fund all the overhead stuff as well. Can't, like, Does that mean that I can't use crowdfunding to do that? The answer is no, you can use crowdfunding to do that. Uh, but you need to segment out um, a chunk of your uh, costs into something that looks like a project. And the easiest way to do that is to take a vertical slice through your organization, like make it a cohort of people going through your program, say, hey, it's the summer cohort uh, of 10 people who are going through our program, and factor in 
all your admin overhead costs into that uh, total pool. And here are like these 10 people that we're going to support to go through um, this time, and that's going to cost us $30,000. So that's the way of making something that looks general into something specific. So that's number one, specific versus general. The second one is um, a pet peeve of ours. Um, and, and it's something that I think a, a trap that the social sector has gotten itself into that we need to get out of. Um, we need to write our campaigns as ones that are inspiring, not earnest. And, what I, and I'll read you to, and I'll explain why uh, inspiring is better. So the, the inspiring one is we're reading Peppa Pig with prison inmates, recording it, and sending the books and the recordings to their kids on the outside. This is a campaign up in rural Victoria in Australia. Second one is we're a registered charity and our mission is to create a world where all kids can connect with their parents regardless of their circumstances. Now, this is a very worthwhile thing to do, but people, th this looks like exactly like something that would be on the about page of a lot of charities' websites. Um, the problem with that is that people share inspiring on the internet. They don't share earnest. So that campaign actually got shared a heap. It got into the hundreds of shares uh, for a relatively small project, um, whereas nobody would kind of logically share the earnest one. Um, and the last one is something that every nonprofit fundraiser already kind of knows, but it's even more true in the uh, crowdfunding world that stories win over figures. Um, so this is a real story that I, I love telling. Um, but actually, it's, it's, it's also, I mean, it's, it's a horribly tragic story, but it's an amazing outcome. Um, so when Saeed was eight, he was actually separated from his family when they fled Somalia. Um, now we're reuniting a mother with a son after 23 years. Um, this actually happened in a real campaign that we ran. Whereas the 11,000 refugees are trapped in limbo, only 10% of them will be processed this year, help us do something about it, is really hard for me to share over a, 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 over a dinner conversation. So it's much easier for us to remember and recite stories than it is to remember and recite figures. And so the, the best campaigns that we've seen craft what they're doing into specific inspiring stories. So that's number one of things to do. The second thing is to set a reasonable target and time frame. This is probably the most important thing to do. Now, when you think about setting your target, normally um, you think about how much is the thing going to cost you to run. In crowdfunding, you've got to think about two other things as well. One is how much time do you have to commit to the campaign? Um, do you have a full-time person? Do you have um, you working on it on the weekends in your spare time? Um, do you have something in between? Uh, and the second thing is, do I have an existing audience already? Now, the projects that make it really big, and by really big we mean over $50,000 or pounds, um, all have a full-time person working on them for at least the campaign duration and normally for <clears throat> a couple of months before, and they all have an existing audience normally in the thousands of emails. Uh, and so uh, we have a rough rule of thumb here, and it is very rough, um, and so uh, there's probably just as many exceptions to this rule as there is, but this will give you a indication um, of what effort you need to put in for what target or what target you should put uh, for your campaign. Um, and so for campaigns under about five grand, you can run them off your own network and you're committing maybe a day a week to them. 
Um, and that's, so that's during the campaign and in the prep time for maybe four weeks before the campaign. For five to 25K, um, most of those campaigns will start with an email database in above a thousand emails. Um, so email is the most important one. Facebook and Twitter are way less important. Um, then they'll normally commit some sort of part-time resource to it. Um, and we'll explain what that part-time resource actually does a bit later on. Uh, the ones that are raising over 25 grand, they normally start with a 3,000 plus email list and they have someone working five, normally more than five days a week on it. Um, so it's not uh, like you just switch it on and the internet magically comes to your crowdfunding campaign. Um, you've got to put in uh, a decent amount of effort into it and you've got to build up your list before you actually run the campaign. So Egger's mission, the, the example that I showed you right at the top of this, they spent the good part of two years, the way that they describe it, building up their audience um, before they actually launched their campaign. Uh, you don't need to normally spend that long, but people it's not uncommon for people to spend six months building a quite targeted list uh, before they launch a, a large campaign. The time frame bit is actually quite simple. Run your campaigns for 46 weeks. Main reason for this is that you'll get bored after that. Um, and it's hard to maintain anybody else's excitement if you are not all that excited. Generally, you'll get most of your action in your first week and your last week. And if you have anything kind of dramatic happen in the interim, you might get something um, going on there. But um, four weeks, if you're running a sub 25 grand campaign, six weeks if you're running um, more than that is the normal guidance. Uh, and you're definitely, the, the data says that you're not any more successful by running your campaign for longer. Cool. Now, I'm going to kind of skip a little bit quickly through the, the perks bit. The perks deserve a whole webinar by themselves, but um, let me kind of go through this very quickly. Perks are things that you give to your donors for um, donating to your campaign and donating specific amounts uh, to your campaign. What they, why they're important is that they move the act of donating to your campaign or supporting your campaign from an act of benevolence to a real value exchange. So it's not just tapping into someone's altruistic motivations, it's tapping into their altruistic motivations and their selfish motivations, which I don't think are opposed. I think they're actually complementary to each other. So not only do I get to be part of creating this great project with you, I get something back in return. Now, generally, there are three types of perks that people use for um, social cause campaigns. Uh, the first one, arguably the most common one, is products and services. So you actually get a product and service related to the campaign for donating a specific amount. And the examples I'm going to use are the ones from Eggers Mission as well, so we'll keep the theme running throughout. Um, so for $250, they had the who knows what they'll paint for you, which was these snout art prints. Um, so snout art there, and as I should explain, uh, Eggers is a sanctuary for rescued farm animals. Uh, and so they would get uh, one of the pigs to um, dip its snout into paint and then, or dirt, and then uh, create a uh, limited edition print from that, um, which is very cool. The second one um, that they have, um, Oh, that's very common is recognition perks, and anyone who's worked in nonprofit land knows these really well. These are the kind of sponsor um, uh, recognition type of um, thing. So for Eggers Mission, they 
because people really wanted to be part of sponsoring part of their sanctuary that they were building, um, they had sponsorship for all sorts of things. And so this one was literally sponsoring a rake in the garden. Um, they had sponsoring for a rock and a fence post, um, both of which were so popular that they ran out of rocks and fence posts to sponsor. Um, but they, for $100, you could sponsor a rake, have your name inscribed on it, and you'll get a certificate of sponsorship along with a photo of your rake, um, which was kind of cool for people who loved um, Edgar's mission. Uh, they got a little bit of it. And the last one, which is normally more high value um, perks, is experiences. Um, and so this one, this actual example is a mixture of experiences and uh, recognition. But if you sponsored a fence post um, and had your name inscribed on it, you got an invitation to an exclusive behind the scenes tour of the new farm and a photo shoot of you with your fence post. Um, so it's like, it was not just you got to sponsor it, but you got to come on site and uh, get a tour around behind the scenes with us from the program. Um, and people were more than willing to pay $1,000 for it. Um, what you'll realize if, when you can think about this is that all these perks are designed for people who love and adore Egger's mission. Um, and so they are um, really exciting for someone who knows Egger's mission, um, wants to be part of their campaign, um, and um, wants to feel part of what they're doing. And these give them a way to feel more part of what they're doing than just giving them money. So we often kind of talk about perks are a better way of participating in the program for the donors. All right. Um, the next step is to build your audience first. So if you remember back from setting your target, um, it was it was important to um, it was important to have an audience before you ran your campaign. Um, the way to do this uh, is to create a table that looks like this. This is going to be look a little bit busy, but I'm going to step through this because it's probably the most important part of running a successful campaign. Now. On the left, you've got who is the audience. Right, let, let's start there. Now, you want to break up your audience into three broad categories. Um, the first are the true believers, the diehard fans, the people who are your certain are like the closest to the program already. They're the ones who you think are going to um, donate and be the first ten donors. Now. Um, Sometimes you don't know who these people are, so you can send out an email to your entire list and say, hey, we need volunteers or foot soldiers for our campaign, and you can build out this true believer list. But often you do know at least some segments within the list. So your like mum and dad and kids and brother and sister are the first people that you need to put on this um, because if they're not going to give, then nobody else is. Um, and then it might be committee or board members or trustees. Um, or then it might be particular beneficiaries in the program um, who are there every single week who would uh, give up anything to see this program succeed. Um, then what you want to do is really think about what does that person care about. And often the easiest way to figure this out is to just ask them. Sounds like a straightforward thing to do. Um, but nobody like tends to want to do that. Um, but what we find generally is that um, when it comes to, say, someone like immediate family, what they really care about is seeing you succeed. Like the project that you're doing is kind of neat, um, 
but what they really care about is seeing you succeed. So when you come to kind of writing, if you're doing a campaign that's only those people, um, then when you come to writing your campaign, actually they need to see your face everywhere. Um, because what they're, 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 they're being part of your success. Um, so you don't like if you're only targeting those people, you don't want to hide behind uh, the program. And then what you want to do, sorry, in the third column is to then think about what channel are you going to use to get to them. Um, and you might want to sequence it. So it might be I'm going to send a one-on-one -on -one email first, so an individualized email first, and then I'm going to text them the same day, and then I'm going to um, send them, oh, call them up and to follow them up. Um, what you will, you'll then can create this huge set of actions out of this and you'll put it on a calendar. Um, so that's the, the normal way of, of doing this. The, the other two groups, the big buckets of who are the influencers and everybody else. Um, now the influencers are normally people that you know already that have a uh, larger reach into an audience that you think will be relevant. Now, I, I'd be quite tight on what the relevant bit is, but normally these are people like your corporate partners, uh, any suppliers, any people that you know that might have a public profile. Um, and what they normally care about is backing a winning horse and getting brand exposure. Um, so they normally come in after you've got some initial momentum from the true believers. Um, because they've got a public profile, they're risking their public profile by supporting you, um, and um, that means that uh, they will only tend to do that when they see that it's been de-risked a bit. Uh, and the last group is everybody else. So normally everybody else has a, um, like it might be all your Gmail contacts, um, it might be a particular demographic that you're targeting, um, and you would often spend, the people who do this really well will spend a lot of time building out just a wide list on that. So they would spend time building out thousands of emails on the everybody else list. Now, those people come in last because they, they have the least connection to you, um, but they like joining a party that somebody else has organized. Uh, because I don't need to do any work, it's already almost funded, I just need to kind of tip it over uh, to get this project funded and I get one of my great perks. Because I, and I know it's going to happen because it's already nearly 100% funded. And the last thing to do is to promote, promote, promote. This is the most important thing uh, to do for your campaign. So your campaign um, won't just magically uh, get funded by putting it up on a crowdfunding platform. The work that you do in promoting it uh, is, is kind of a bit like an exponential curve. Like the more work that you put in, the more this you know, network effect multiplies out, and the more likely that someone like us is going to promote your campaign because we love promoting campaigns that are taking off that are really popular. Now, I went over this in the last slide, but I just want to repeat it again. There is a specific order that you need to do this promotion in. So the first thing that you need to do is get early momentum with a true believer. So when you launch, you want to get to 30% of your target in three days. So if you're looking for, um, say, $10,000, you need to get to $3,000 in three days. Now, you can do the calculation. So you normally have an average donation of about $100. That means I need to get 30 donors to donate to this campaign in my first three days. And so what I'm going to do is get 50 people that I know personally, um, I'm going to get them to be uh, my first donors and you know only 30 of them are actually going to donate but I'm going to work really hard in my first three days to make sure that I have um, 30 people give. 
So that, that's, um, that's really important to get that early momentum because you don't get the permission to do the other things unless you get that early momentum. Second thing is that once you've got that early momentum, you can then get reach from the influencers. So they won't give to you, or they won't support your campaign and push it out to their audience until you've de-risked it for them. And the last one is like you get volume with everybody else. So this is where you get your kind of huge amounts of volume. It's way more exciting for those people to be supporting a campaign that has just taken off. It's already at 50% in its first week. Um, this is something that everybody else is talking about, and so I should be talking about it as well. That is a way more compelling proposition than, oh, this thing is struggling. Maybe I should help them out. Nobody does that. So make sure you get the first two right and then go to the third one. The reason that this works, and this is like helps you understand <clears throat> why it's important that you do it in this order, is that, so the reason this works is that the people who really love you and adore you, <clears throat> they feel important because you know, they discovered you first and they were here before all the follow honors came on. Um, they, they knew you before you were famous. So those people who you know, backed you from the start, those people feel important because they were the first ones to learn about it and probably you used them to create the campaign. The influencers, they get social currency by telling people about you. They like promoting things to their audience that are popular. They don't want to be the first people, they want to be the kind of second and third people. And the last group, that everybody else group, they get to be involved with very little effort on their part. So they can, the way that we like to describe it is they can join a party that somebody else has organized. Um, so if you do it in this order, uh, people, each of the groups gets what they need. And that's the really important thing. If everyone is getting what they need, all of a sudden you've created a campaign that's as fun as buying shoes. Fantastic. That's the end of our webinar for today. If you want any more information, we've got a heap of great podcasts and blog posts on our blog at chuff.org slash blog. Uh, but otherwise, we're looking forward to seeing your campaign.